Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the monthly web workshop on Fluke Connect. Today's topic is the Fluke Connect desktop. I will be providing you with details on how to edit an image. My name is Sean Carta. I am a Tier 3 Technical Support Engineer and the Fluke Lead. So, a few housekeeping items before I begin the presentation. Phones will be muted during the entire presentation. Feel free to type into the question section of your screen at any time. Please limit your questions to the topic of today's session and questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. And finally, this session will be recorded and uploaded to our Fluke Connect website in the next few days. I will show you that link to access the recording at the end of the presentation. Here's our agenda for today. I will start with a Fluke Connect overview to provide you with the high level explanation of the Fluke Connect software. Then, I will provide an overview of how to edit a single image. Next, I will show how to use the optimize image options. Then, I will show how to use the analyze image options. Next, I will show how to add notes to an image. Then, I will show how to use the group edit option. And finally, I will answer questions from the audience today. The first section is a high-level overview of Fluke Connect. I just want to cover a few basic facts about Fluke Connect for anyone that may be new to the software. Fluke Connect works with over 80 different tools in 11 different categories, including digital multimeters, clamp meters, installation testers, vibration meters, scope meters, process meters, insulation testers, infrared cameras, power loggers, and power quality monitors. The easiest way to tell if a tool will work with the Fluke Connect software is if it has the letters FC in the model name. So the 376 FC clamp meter, 1664 FC installation tester, and the T3000 FC temperature module all would be Fluke Connect enabled. The only exception is the Fluke suite of thermal image cameras. Most of them do work with Fluke Connect, but do not include the FC in the model name. And Fluke Connect is, an, is available in over 74 different countries. One other important note, the Fluke Connect measurement software is 100% free. So here's an overall flow of how the data is stored and moved through the various systems in a typical troubleshooting scenario. So let's say you've got an intermittent blower motor problem. Um, this is with your rooftop HVAC package unit in step number one. So in step number two, you've grabbed your 376 FC clamp meter to help diagnose the issue. And you connect it to the blower motor. In step number three, the 376 FC clamp meter will communicate its readings to the Fluke Connect mobile app via a Bluetooth connection. In step number four, the Fluke Connect mobile app will then upload the readings to the Fluke Connect cloud where they are permanently stored. Now, if the cell phone is out of range, the data will be stored on the phone until it reconnects to either a cell signal or a Wi-Fi signal. And finally, last but not least, in step number five, users can then access their Fluke Connect cloud data in the cloud via any web-enabled device, such as a web browser, the mobile app, or our desktop software. So as I just noted on the previous slide, the Fluke Connect software works in three different applications. The Fluke Connect mobile app, and this is the key interface for capturing measurements from the tools the Fluke Connect web app, and this is where you go to create assets and perform analysis. And finally, the Fluke Connect desktop app, which is the key interface for downloading thermal images and creating thermal image reports, and the app that we're going to be working with today. The next thing that's important for you to know is, the, <clears throat> is that Fluke Connect software comes in three different tiers. This is often one of the more confusing aspects of the Fluke Connect software. So here's a quick overview. First, in the first tier, we've got Fluke Connect measurements. This 
is available to all users for free. And this tier enables users to capture measurements from their tools and save the data to the cloud, just like I explained on the previous slide. The second tier, or the middle tier, is the Fluke Connect Assets tier, which comes with a one-year free trial for users and is $250 per license per person after that. Now, this tier includes all of the features available in the Fluke Connect Measurements tier, plus asset management, asset health tracking, and work order management. And last but not least, we've got the Fluke Connect Condition Monitoring tier. This is the third or top tier. And this includes the first year of the software subscription with the purchase of a sensor or hardware. This tier includes both the measurements features and the asset features, along with the condition monitoring features. All right, next I will provide a high level overview of how to edit an image, then cover each editing option in more detail. So this is just going to be an overview to familiarize you with the software itself and the different options that are available. Then I'll go into each one of the different tabs or, or areas in more detail uh, after we cover the overview. So before I jump into how to edit an image, there is one important piece of information for you to understand about Fluke Connect Desktop, and that is the difference between synced and unsynced files. Synced files will be synced with your Fluke Connect Cloud account and will be visible in the web app and the mobile app. The only files that are synced from the Fluke Connect desktop software are the ones that reside in the FC Cloud folder. You can see that folder here, the FC Cloud folder. Unsynced files will not be synced with your Fluke Connect Cloud account and therefore will not be visible in the web app or the mobile app. Now in my demo account here, it's very clear and simple to identify which files are which because I have them labeled. So you can see we've got the folder called the FC Cloud folder. This is a system created folder and should be left as is, it should not be renamed. And then I've added a folder called unsynced images. This is the folder that I created myself that contains images of files that I do not want to have synced to my FC Cloud account. So why would you want to have images not synced to your account? Well, maybe there are test images you took to try out your thermal camera and some different settings on your thermal camera while you were in the office. You don't need to have those synced to your account. Or maybe you set up a process by which after you run a route, you download all of the images to your unsynced folder and they sit there until you've, you're done editing them and they're ready for prime time viewing and then you copy them over or move them over to the FC Cloud folder. It's completely up to you though, which files you decide to sync or not sync. Okay, moving on, there are two different views available in the Fluke Connect desktop software from the measurements tab. You've got the explorer view and the tile view. And here we're looking at, if you look at the very, um, we've clicked on the measurements tab in the software and we've clicked on the very far icon on the right. This is our tile view, or explorer view rather. So we're looking at the explorer view. And from here, if we wanted to edit an image, we simply click on the image that we want to edit. We double click on that image. So you would log into your Fluke Connect desktop software, click on the measurements tab, select the explorer view, which is the one on the very far right. Decide whether you're going to work on your synced images or your unsynced images and then find the file that you want to work with and double click on it to launch the editor. As you can see here in the Explorer view, there is no preview of what those files look like, unfortunately, and that is just the way it is. You just get this Fluke fan logo on each one of your images. And once you've double clicked the image, it takes you into the editor, and from there you can add hot points, cold points, special markers, etc. This is the second view available in the Fluke Connect desktop software. This is called the tile view, which is very useful because it provides you with a small preview of what the image looks like. This makes it easier to find the image you're looking for and it makes it easier if you don't know the names of your files yet. So here we click on the measurements tab. We click on the um, not very far right, the one right next to it uh, icon here, and then we get the 
tile view. This is the tile view. So we get a little preview of what the image looks like. Now from here, if we want to edit this image, it works the same way as the Explorer view. You move your mouse over the image itself, double click with the left mouse button, and that will take you into the editor screen. Now there's another way to edit an image from the tile view. And if you prefer working with menus as opposed to double clicks, you can simply click on the drop down list box right here next to the um, the right hand side of the image and you'll see that you've got several different options available the first of which is edit so you can click on the drop down list box select the edit option and that will take you into the editor there's several other options available in the menu and we'll cover those in the software in a moment so if I double click on the image or I select the edit option it takes me to this screen which is the thermal image editor and you can see this is the file that I'm working on that's the name of the file that I'm working on and it takes us to the first sub tab called optimize so here you can change things such as the palette you use to take the thermal image and some other settings like saturation saturation and background temperature you can also adjust the span and we'll cover what each one of these mean in more detail in a moment again remember this is just the overview Next, the next tab we have available is the Analyze tab. So this is really where the meat and potatoes of the editor resides. This is where you can add your own custom markers, rectangles, circles, etc. Um, you can also select default information, hot, the hot point temperature, the cold point temperature, the center point. You can see of the options available, we've only got the center point selected and that information is here, 87.51. That matches up with what we have there. We'll go into this in more detail when we get into the analyze section of the presentation. Next, we've got the notes. And here you can add notes to the image, things like tracking hot point temperature since it's noticeably hotter. Um, and these notes will show up in the reports that you create. And last but not least, we've got the image info tab. And here you can view details about the image, things like the, the calibration range, the camera model number, the camera manufacturer, oops, let's go back, etc. And what's great about this is if you have more than one camera model, and often uh, our customers do, in this case, this model is the TI450 Professional, but you may have you know, one of our newer models, the TIS55 Plus, or one of our older models like a TIS-65 or a TIS-75, here you can identify which camera took the image that you're looking at. Okay, now I will take you into the live software, but before I do that, the most important advice I can give you when it comes to editing your images is to create a backup set of images before you start editing them because there is no undo option in the software. So many of us are used to being able to undo something that we've just done. If you've performed an edit and you save that image and save that change to the image, that image can no longer be reverted back. So what I recommend is after you've used your thermal camera to run your maintenance route or to do an inspection, if there's a troubleshooting issue, take the files, the thermal image files, copy them from your thermal image camera to your computer in a folder called originals. Do not touch the files in that folder. Leave them as is as originals. Take a copy of those files, all of the originals, copy them into another folder that you're going to use to edit. And then take those files and move them into the Fluke Connect desktop software. It's very simple, it's, it's what you would probably do in most cases if you had an important file. You save the original, create a copy, and then work with the copy of that file. That way, if anything goes wrong during the editing process, you've got the original file on your computer. You can just copy that file, that original file, over into your Fluke Connect desktop software. So just a very important note, it's uh, just a good standard operating procedure to employ when you're working with any software for that matter, not just the Fluke Connect desktop software. Okay, let's go in and edit an image. So we're going to look at the video. Let's do it real quick. want to make sure you can see what I'm seeing. Yep, that's great. Okay. So um, here we're looking at the Fluke Connect desktop software. We're on the measurements tab and we're on the explorer view because we 
we don't have the actual preview, right? We just have the files here. You can see we've got our Fluke Connect Cloud files and our Unsync files. Oh, there we go. We've got the Explorer view and the Tile view options. We're looking at the Explorer view. And again, we've got the, the FC Cloud folder files, which are synced, and our unsynced images. Now, before in the presentation, we were looking at unsynced images, but here we're looking at the FC Cloud files, so these are the synced images. So these images will also be available to view in our web app and our mobile app. So in order to access the editor file from here, we just select the file that we want to view and double click on it. So we would go here, double click, and that takes us into the Fluke Connect desktop software into the editor mode. So you can see here that we're looking at the thermal image editor and the name of the file that we're working on is 001. And this is the information that you would see displayed as you saw in the presentation. And um, that's basically all you have to do to launch and go into the editor. So we're going to close this and we're going to take a look at the tile view next. So we simply click the X in the upper right hand corner and now we switch to the tile view using the icons up here in the upper right hand corner. And what that will do is give us a preview of each one of our thermal images. So we're on the measurements tab in the tile view. And from here, we've got several different viewing options. So under the filter, we can filter our images by type. So IR images, IR videos, non-IR images, non-IR videos, etc. We can also sort our images. So we can sort them based on date, newest to oldest, oldest to newest, on name, A to Z, Z to A, or by asset or asset group. These last two are fairly new options requested by our customers. Next, we've got the display options. We can display all or we can set a custom date. This is very handy because let's say last week you went out and you ran a maintenance route and you've got all the images that you wanna work with just from last week. So you can set that custom date range so you'll narrow the amount of thermal images that are displayed on the screen. And last but not least, of course, we've got the search option. The search option enables us to search for a thermal image by name. So keep that in mind when you're coming up with your naming conventions. So here we've got a thermal image taken with a TI-480 professional thermal image camera. And remember, we can either double click on that to edit it, or we can select the drop down list box. And here we've got those different options available, edit. That's what we would select to edit the image. We can rename the thermal image. So right now it's 0001. Zero 01, we can rename it if we wanted to. We could email this image to send a PNG file or an IS2 file to someone else to view. We can export the file. So we can export the file in various file types like bitmap, JPEG, etc., to a different folder on your PC. And we can delete the image. This does permanently delete the file. So you know, keep in mind that if you do select this option, it will be permanently deleted. And last but not least, we've got the file location. So if you want to see where the files are, say maybe you've made a mistake on editing this one and you want to copy one of your originals over, you can use the file location to find where those files reside to copy them into the proper location. So what we're going to do is we're going to click the edit option in our drop down list box here to launch us into the thermal image editor. So you can see just how easy it is to access the edit option. You can either double click on the image or select the edit option to go into the editor. And now we're in the editor. Okay, next we're going to talk about how to optimize an image. So we'll cover each of the options available in the optimize image options. This, this is a very, very busy chart. There's a lot of information here, but we'll go over it step by step. So um, 
Here, you use the optimized features to make the image the best looking image ever. You really want to highlight the area of the image you want your viewer to focus on. That's what optimization is about. So that's what all this information helps you do. Um, in, in the kind of the center of the screen right here, we've got what's known as the scale or the level and span. So what is level and span? The software will automatically detect the hottest and coldest points in the image, and that is known as the span. It also detects the midpoint, and that is known as the level, just to familiarize you with some of our terminology. Then it takes a color palette and applies that spectrum of color in that span or range. So here you can see that our hot point is 109, and our cold point is negative 21.6, and the level is 43.8, or the midpoint. Next, we've got palette, and right now we've got the blue-red palette selected. A palette is simply a color scheme. So infrared cameras and software provide a choice of color palettes that can help quickly distinguish thermal variations and patterns in an image. And what's great is that you can use your thermal image imager or your camera to select a palette while you're out in the field, but once you get back to the office, if you decide to choose a different palette, you can do that using our software. You can make adjustments to the image by selecting a different palette once you get back to the office. Next, we've got saturation next to the number four. Saturation, you use the saturation option to specify what color you want things to appear that are outside of the span. So hotter than the hottest point and colder than the coldest point. So for instance, here, um, hotter than the hottest point, which is 109, is using a dark red burgundy color to, to name that. So you can see that there is a little bit of area on the chart where it's a dark burgundy, and that's gonna be hotter than our hottest point. Next, we've got color alarm. Some infrared cameras and software offer user-selectable high and or low apparent temperature color alarms to quickly highlight areas that are outside of the normal temperature range. Now, again, not all of our thermal image cameras have this option, but a lot of them do. So you can open up your thermal image user manual. You can get that on the fluke.com website and do a little research on color alarms and how they work with your thermal imager. Next, we've got emissivity. So everything emits thermal radiation, but not everything emits energy in the same way. For example, chrome and shiny objects are terrible emitters, while black objects are good emitters. And this feature enables you to make an adjustment for the surface of the object you're taking an image of into account for the emissivity level of that object. When we go into the software, I'll show you the options available. But basically, like if you've got something shiny like aluminum or um, steel, et cetera, you could select those options in the emissivity list. Next, we've got background temperature. This is simply the ambient temperature. So if it's 95 degrees where you're at, maybe you're in Florida, you can select the background temperature as 95 degrees. Transmission, this is an option if you're using an IR window. You select the settings that is, that is specified on the IR window. Now this is gonna be very rare circumstance. I don't believe most people have IR windows, but if you happen to have an IR window, and I have spoken to some customers that do, um, this is where you make those adjustments based on the IR window settings. Over here, next to the number nine, you can zoom in. Now this is a digital zoom option, so you wanna be careful because it can pixelate your image. Down here at the bottom, we've got IR fusion blending. Right now it's set to full infrared, but if we use this uh, little button here and drag it over on the sliding scale, we can take it all the way over to full visible image. So if you need to provide your users with context by showing them a little bit of the visible light image, you can do that. Um, up here we've got the rotate left and rotate right, if for some reason your image needs to be rotated. Next to the number 12, we have what's called the parallax view adjustment. So if your infrared image is offset from the actual object when you're scrolling over here and maybe looking at more of the visible light image and it's a little bit misaligned, you can use the parallax view adjustment to align the object. 
And over here at the bottom, we've got what's called PIP or picture in picture. This enables you to see the visible light image surrounding the infrared image. And last but not least, up here in the right-hand corner, after you've made all of your adjustments and your thermal image looks just the way you want it to look, don't forget to click the Save button, the blue Save button, to save your, save your work. All right, now I'm going to go into the software and show you how to optimize an image. So remember, we just double click on the image in order to launch the thermal image editor. And here are our three cups on the image. So I have hot water in the red cup, room temperature water in the yellow cup, and cold water in the blue cup. And you can see that in our image, the hottest point on the image is here in the red cup. It's 107.95 and the coldest point on the image is here on our blue cup, 38.12. And remember the point of the optimized tab is to make the image the best looking image ever. So what happens if I go down here and deselect the auto scale? Remember this is automatically generated when you uh, upload the image to our software, but if you wanna make adjustments here to, to maneuver the image here, you can do so. Um, all you have to do is deselect the auto scale and then select uh, the midpoint and you can click and drag. Now, that looks terrible, obviously. That's not a very helpful image, so uh, we're going to go ahead and drag it back down, see what happens when we drag it all the way down to the bottom. That's a little bit more helpful if we were focusing on the cold cup, right, if that was the purpose of this thermal image. In our case, we're focusing on the hot cup, so this doesn't help us at all. Let's drag it back up again and go a little bit more slowly and see if we can make a little adjustment here. Now, from this perspective, this is very handy because what this has done is this has eliminated all of the noise from the thermal image, right? We don't care about the room temperature cup or the cold cup, and that's gone away. We do want to focus in on the hot cup. And what you can see is not only do we see the hot cup, we have a lot more definition than we had before. We can see the borders of the cup, and within the cup itself, we can see exactly how much hot liquid is in there and where the hottest point of that is. So just by making some adjustments to our scale and our span, moving it around a little bit, we were able to focus our viewer's attention on the area that we wanted them to focus on. So now we're gonna go ahead and reset our image. We can do that simply by clicking on the auto scale and it'll snap back to where it was before. And next we're gonna talk about the palette. So right now I'm using the blue-red palette option because for my purposes, it makes the chart very simple to understand and interpret, right? Red means hot, blue means cold, kind of a universal color, color connotations. So that's why I chose the blue-red. But there are other palettes available. And remember, palette is simply a color scheme. The color tones, correspond to the apparent surface temperatures of the target. So the key is to select a palette that best shows the thermal differences for your specific application. Slight differences are easier to see with the monochromatic scale, such as the gray scale or an amber scale. High contrast palettes make it easier to quickly find obvious anomalies. And most customers I work with seem to prefer the iron bow palette, and it generally makes for very good images, but you should select the palette that best works for your image. Like in my case, I prefer the blue-red because red equals hot and blue equals cold, and that really makes this chart very easy to understand. But I'll show you what it looks like when I select a different option here. So if I select iron bow, that's what the chart would look like or the image would look like, and that's okay, but for my purposes, I prefer the blue-red, so I'm gonna send it back. And we'll reset everything, and deselect the auto scale, and move on to the saturation option. So here you can see we've got four options, none, standard, red, blue, and white, black. So what is saturation? 
Saturation is simply what color do you want things to appear that are out of range. If you select the standard option, it will use the palette to define the out of range colors. So right now mine is set to standard and I'm on the blue red palette. So you can see everything that's hotter than the hottest point is this dark burgundy color and everything that's colder than the coldest point is this dark blue. And that's because I'm using the blue red palette and I'm using a standard sat saturation. Now I'm, if I switch to red blue it's basically the same It's just a brighter red and a brighter blue. So I'm going to switch to white black so you'll see what happens once we do that. So now everything that's hotter than the hottest point would show white and everything that's colder than the coldest point would show black but because we don't have any of those uh, temperatures on the on the chart as it is we need to adjust the scale to show you what happens. So if we slide it up now everything that's colder than 160 degrees turns black. Obviously, that's not very useful for what we want to do, but just shows you how saturation works. Everything that's um, colder than the coldest point is now black, and everything that's hotter than the hottest point is white. We could do the reverse, make everything white. And we could play around with this so that we basically have the same thing we had earlier, but we've blacked out everything that's unimportant and focused in on just our hot cup. So you can use the saturation to block out things that are irrelevant on your image if you want your viewer to focus in on something specific. So we're going to set it back to standard to reset all of our parameters and move on to color alarms. We'll deselect auto scale. Actually, we don't need to do that. We'll just go into color alarms. So here you can see we've got three options. We've got none, no color alarms, isotherm, and then color alarm. So isotherm lets you eliminate a temperature range from within your span. So before with saturation, we were looking at things that were hottest, hotter than the hottest point and colder than the coldest point, so outside of our span. Now we're going to look at information or data that's within our span, so between the 108 and the 38. So let's take a look at how this works. You'll notice that an additional parameter pops up here. We deselected auto scale, we select isotherm, and now we've got this additional set of parameters here. And if I expand those out just a little bit, you'll see what happens. So this is a range within our hottest hot point and our coldest cold point and within that range we've got an isotherm color of bright red. So now everything between 94 degrees and 108 degrees shows up in this bright red isotherm color. So it's an area within the chart that we want to maybe you know block out or, or, or either block out or highlight depending upon how you want to use it. Now in our case we're going to change that color to gray because the red on red was a little bit hard to see for some people. So now you can see that that range is marked as a gray color and it stands out in our chart. So that's the isotherm color. Okay, we're going to reset everything and go back and then we're going to cover color alarms. So we'll select the color alarm option and pause it here for a moment. So on Fluke infrared cameras, when you scan the area with color alarms activated on your camera, you see a visible light image of everything within the high and low parameters. Anything that's outside of those temperatures will appear in infrared. And that feature gives you a quick indication of where issues might be so you can drill into those areas. So if I select um, color alarm and alarm out of range, um, what, and, and then I drag the scale over here, so the scale shows anything from 94 to 108, anything within that range will be, um, that's, that is our alarm range. So everything outside of that range will alarm. So let me show you if I move the, and right now what you're seeing is, is that everything that's between 94 and 108 is in visible, a visible light image and everything else is in infrared. Now if I drag that, I can make it a little bit bigger. Watch what happens.
So um, right now I've got the scale set to 62 degrees to 94 degrees. This is our alarm range, 62 to 94. So everything outside of, outside of that range will alarm. You can see how the temperatures from 94 to 108 show in infrared. So 94 to 108, that's this range here, and that's this red area here. Those are going to um, alarm. And everything from 38 to 62, which is over here on our cold cup, shows an infrared as well. Those are outside the color alarm range, so they also show an infrared. So the two areas of the chart that show an infrared are between 94 and 108 and between uh, 38 and 62. So the little section of the hot cup and a little section of the cold cup. Now, if I want to flip that and set our alarm range for everything inside our range and reverse that, guess what happens? So we're going to switch this from alarm outside range to alarm inside range. Right now, most of the image is in visible light and some of it's in infrared. And now we've got exactly the opposite. Most of the image is in infrared and we've got just a tiny section of the chart in visible light image. So really the palette, saturation, and color alarms are all just ways for you to focus the image on the areas that you want to bring attention to. They're just different tools to do it. You can use the span, the palette, the saturation, and the color alarm in order to do that. So we're going to go ahead and set everything back to the way it was before. Set color alarm to none and check the auto scale. And we're going to move on to emissivity. So, as you know, everything emits thermal radiation, but not everything emits energy in the same way. Low emissivity surfaces, such as shiny metals, can reflect infrared energy from other objects and throw off your image and your measurement accuracy. So you want to use this option here to select the type of material that you were taking a thermal image of. So was it polished aluminum? Was it strongly oxidized aluminum, asbestos, brass, brick, bronze, and so on? You can scroll through. Find the type of object that you were taking a thermal image of. Select this option here to properly set the emissivity for the image. Next, we've got background temperature, which is simply the ambient temperature in the air. So again, if you're in Florida and the temperature outside is 95 degrees, just adjust your settings accordingly. And transmission window, if you're using a transmission or uh, an IR window, you need to make an adjustment to the transmission settings based on whatever the IR window setting says. And these three parameters, emissivity, background temperature, and transmission, will adjust the temperature data in each pixel based on calculations. So most people will not need to use these, but they are available to you if you want. Next, of course, we've got the, um, the zoom option. And remember, it is a digital zoom to focus in, but it does pixelate, pixelate. We've got the IR fusion blending. So if we click on the slider and we move it over just a little bit, you can see that the image changes. So now we're seeing the infrared image, but we're also seeing the visible light image behind that as well. We've got the arrows to rotate the image left or rotate right. The parallax view adjustment in order to align our thermal image with our visible light image. And last but not least, we've got picture in picture, which shows the visible light border. And of course, don't forget the save button. Once you've made all of your optimizations, you want to remember to click the blue save button. Moving on, the next section is how to use the analyze image options, where I'll cover each of the options available in detail there. So here, you can see we're in the thermal image editor. We're on the analyze tab. And the first two options we have available relate to the asset. So if this image was assigned to an asset, the asset name would be 
here, say front room boiler or back room motor, whatever we decided to name our asset, that information would be here. The severity, the severity can be designated as normal, moderate, severe, and extreme, and it's simply the condition of your asset or the issue that you're looking at for that particular asset. If the motor is really old and about to die, that would be probably an extreme severity. If the motor is brand new and working great, that would be probably normal for a severity. Next, we've got the ability to add custom markers. So we can add a single point, a line, a rectangle, a circle, parallelogram. Um, so you've got the ability to add customized markers, which is great. And down here, we've got the ability to turn on or off standard markers, hot, cold, center point. Right now, you can see the only option we have checked and visible on the chart is the center point, 87.51, 87.51. And last but not least, you can have line graph data if you click on this drop down list box. So if you add the marker type line, then you can view the line graph data associated with that line marker here. So let's go into the software and analyze an image. So we double click to launch the Fluke Connect image editor. We select the analyze tab. We've got our asset name, our asset severity. So those are the options available. Unassigned normal, moderate, severe, and extreme. We've got our custom markers that are available to us. And then we've got our standard markers. So right now you can see we've got the hot point here selected, the center point, and the cold point. So if we wanted to, we could remove the cold point and the center point simply by deselecting those checkboxes, which is great. And this is, again, um, a frequently asked question we get from our customers. I want to deselect the cold and center point. I want to focus on the hot point. So you simply just come into the table here and deselect those checkboxes, and they go away. So next, if you look here, you'll notice that the hot marker is using red text. So it's red text on red background. That makes it a little bit difficult to see. So what if we want to change the color of that marker? And maybe instead of having it on top, I want to move it to the bottom or to the right or the left. How would I do that? I simply find the marker in the table here and double click on that option. And that will pop up the editor for that particular marker. So I double click on that option and here now you can see we've got the edit marker options. So we've got the marker name hot, I could change this if I wanted to, the background temperature and emissivity for this chart, the marker color. So this is the color of the text that appears. So we will want to change that and we're going to change that. We can move this over so we can get a preview of what we're looking at change that to white. You can see that's much more visible. We also want to move the location. So we move the the data to below the actual marker. So by double clicking on any of these options, it takes you into edit marker mode and you can make changes. Makes it very, very handy so that you can change the colors to make your chart more readable, your, or your image more readable. Now next, we're gonna add a custom marker. I'm going to start with the rectangle type. And what you'll see is, is that um, once I click on the rectangle, it turns on the, I've got the ability to edit and delete those as well. Um, I, sl I single click that with my left mouse button and you'll see that now I've got a, a very thin yellow box around that particular marker type. That means I'm in the draw marker mode and I'm in the draw rectangle marker. So now whenever I move my mouse over the thermal image, it's going to know that I want to create a rectangle marker. So I simply move to the image itself, left mouse click and hold and drag and that will create the box. It pops up the marker. So the marker name will default to a, a system generated name. In this case, it's AO. So that's not very useful or descriptive. So what I'll probably do is change that. I'm gonna call that something like area of concern. And we can see that the label's off. 
it's not really visible from where it's at, so we're going to move the label to a new location and then click Apply to save our changes. So now, over here, instead of it saying AO, the name has been changed. The marker name now says Area of Concern, and we've changed it from uh, AO to Area of Concern, and we've moved it from off to the left where it was hard, hard to view to off to the right. Let's add another custom marker. We're going to add a line. So remember, you just click on that option, and then you click and drag on the chart to create that marker type. And it automatically defaults the name to LO. We could change that if we want. In our case, we're just going to edit the marker color. So it's white now. Maybe we'll use orange. Then we click the Apply button, and now we've got an orange marker. Now, in this case, this makes it a little harder to read, so we might want to change the color again, but I want to show you something else. Because we've added the type of marker called line, you can see line graph data. So the line here is that orange color, and the line graph is also that orange color. So you've got a lot of additional information about the line graph data here. Let's say we want to edit one of the markers we already have on the screen, our rectangle. Maybe it's not big enough. We want to make it a little bit bigger. So we go to that area, we single click on it, and it takes us into edit mode. So now you'll see that the four corners of the rectangle have little markers on them. And we can click and drag any one of those four corners to adjust the size of our rectangle marker, make it a little bit bigger. Next, we're going to add a point marker. This is another frequently asked question of the support team. How do you add a reference point? So we want to add a point marker. So we, remember, single click with the left mouse button and then find a point on the chart to add our marker. We get the edit marker options. This is going to be a reference point. So I, I'm going to relabel this and call it reference point. And because this is going to be a reference marker, we select the checkbox for reference marker. So if we make this a reference marker, every other point we add on the graph will reference back to this particular point. I'll show you how that works. So this reference point, and you can see the little bullseye, which indicates it's a reference marker, is 106. If we add an additional marker, now here we can see that if this marker were just a normal marker and we did not have a reference marker, it would say 45.25 degrees. But because we're referring back to this reference point, we're going to get a delta instead. So the delta is the difference between the reference point and this, this uh, measurement. So in this case, it's 106 to 45. This, that's 22 degrees colder than the reference point. So that's the delta. So that's how you can work with reference points on your charts. Now, we've got quite a lot of information on our thermal image, probably too much. And in our case, we want to focus mainly on the hot, not the cold. So I want to go back in and delete some of this information. Let's delete the line. I'll show you how to do that. You simply come over here, highlight the line, and then select the trash can, and it's gone. Next, we're going to delete the, the not the reference point, but the additional marker point. So we simply single click to select that with our left mouse button, then single click the trash can with our left mouse button, and delete, and voila, that's gone as well. So that's how you can go back in and clean up your, your image after you've made some changes. Okay, that's how you can go in and analyze your images, add custom markers, turn on and off the hot point, cold point, and center point information. Next, I will cover how to add notes to an image. So here is the thermal image editor, and you can see that we've got the notes option. Here you can enter or view various types of notes associated with the image. And notes can be observations or analysis of issues in the image, or just flag a continue um, flag to continue monitor, monitoring an area. And notes can be added from any platform: the mobile app, 
the web app or the desktop app. Just the generic notes, again, the generic notes can be added from the mobile app, the web app, or the desktop app. You've also got photo notes. Um, these include the visible light image of the infrared image along with any other photo notes that you've taken with your IR camera. So photo notes come from your camera. Next, we've got voice notes. You can use this field to listen to audio notes that are also recorded with your infrared camera. And finally, we've got annotations. And annotations is simply just another form of notes that are available to the user. And in, in this area here, this is where you would go to add a new note. Just type in whatever you want to add and then click the Add button and click the Save button to save the changes. So let's go in and add a note. Oh, oops. So double click to launch the editor, select the notes option. And here you can see that we already have an existing note, motor is running hot. You can see the person that added the note, it happens to be me, I'm logged into my demo account, Riley Russell, and the date and timestamp. And this information will be available in the reports. At this point, if you want, you could use the pencil icon to edit. Pencil icon in Fluke software always means edit. Trash can icon always means delete. So we're just going to go ahead and add a new note. So I'll just type a new note in this field. We'll come back to that. But first we'll look at the visible light image of the infrared image, the voice notes, and the annotations, which are just additional types of notes. So here we go back to the notes. We type in a new note. and click Add. Now we've got our new note with the date and timestamp. And if we want to save this information, we click the blue Save button. Pretty simple and straightforward. Again, remember, notes can be added using the mobile app, the web app, or the desktop app. So the last section is how to use the group edit option, where I'll cover different ways to do group edits. So to use the group edit option from the Explorer view, um, remember you go to the measurements tab, you select the very far right, right icon here to get to the Explorer view, and you simply select more than one image. In this case, we're looking at our unsynced images, Use the left mouse button to select the first image, then hold the shift key down and select the second image, just like you would do in any other Windows operating system in order to do a multi-select. Single click the first item with the left mouse button, click the shift key and hold it down, single click the left mouse button to select the second item. So here we've got two different files selected. And from there, we'll be able to see the group actions options. So in order to edit, we use the edit icon, which is the little pencil on top of a stack of papers, or in this case, thermal images. So we would click that option, and that would take us into the image editor. Before we do that, I'm going to show you the next way to do this in the tile view. So here we've got the measurements tab selected and we're looking at the tile view this time. So in order to select multiple images in the tile view, you need to use the box in the upper left hand corner. Simply select the check next to each one of the images that you want to use a group edit option on. Here you can see we've got two of them selected, two selected measurements. The group actions happen to appear down at the bottom here, and we use the edit icon, so the pencil on top of the stack of papers. We click on that, and that takes us into the group edit option, or the batch thermal editor. From here, we only have a couple of options. We can change the palette, the saturation, and decide whether we want to enable ultra contrast mode and display marker graphics on or off. So what's great about this is, let's say you've done a bunch of um, changes and your boss says, hey, I don't like the blue-red palette. I want everything to be switched over to iron bow. You're like, oh my gosh, I have a hundred images. I have to go in into every image and switch it back over to iron bow. Well, no, you don't. You can simply use the um, thermal image group edit option and select as many of the images as you need to change. 
change from blue red to iron bow and then click the in this case it's not the blue save button it's a little old-fashioned diskette to save to save your changes but here you can see that I've selected two images to work on and I've got those both down here so whatever changes I make up here will be reflected down here you can also change the scale as well so let's use the group edit option show you how that works So remember, in tile view, you select the checkboxes. So now we've got two images selected. Then we go over to the group actions and we select the icon that says edit. We single click on that with the left mouse button. It will launch the batch thermal image editor. We scroll down we can see these are the two images that we've selected to change and we can switch the palette to iron bow per our boss's instructions scroll back down and see what those changes look like and if we wanted to we could save that change if not we can try other options And as I stated, don't forget to select the save if you want to save any of the changes. And that's it for our batch editor mode. So if you have additional questions, here are some Fluke Connect resources that you can refer to. You can look at the Fluke Connect website. It's available at fluke.com under products, under Fluke Connect. If you file, follow that path using the browser, you can find more information about Fluke Connect. You can find more Fluke Connect workshop videos. I mentioned that this recording will be available on the website in a few days to a week. If you go to fluke.com slash quick start, and select the fourth tile over, so it's the last one on the right that says handheld tools, and scroll down to the bottom half of the screen, you'll see, gosh, I think we've got um, 20 different recordings available, so lots of different options. If you have questions about product demos or purchasing, you could contact the Flu Connect sales team. They're available at this number and this email address. And last but not least, if you have additional questions following this presentation or have technical issues, you can contact the technical support team at Fluke Connect Support at fluke.com or at 425-200-0080. Again, that's Fluke Connect Support at fluke.com. It's a long email address, but it's descriptive. And then that's our, our phone number. So that concludes the presentation portion of the Fluke Connect workshop. In the next week or two, you will all be receiving an email thanking you for attending. It will include a link to the recording of this presentation and a link to register for the next Fluke Connect workshop. Also, at the conclusion of this session, you'll be asked to provide feedback on the presentation in a short survey. Please take a moment to do so. And if you have any topics you'd like to hear from, us about. Please enter those topic suggestions. I will be taking questions now and as a reminder please keep questions to the topic we just covered. Give me a moment to stop the recording. And we'll proceed with answering the questions. <laughs>